Coming up on DTNS, Facebook's going to pay some publishers. HP has a very pretty laptop and why we are at risk from too few robots taking our jobs. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, September 30th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chain. We were just reminiscing on Good Day Internet about uh, the dangerous world of the 1970s we grew up in. <laughs> uh, if you want to get that and, and other wider conversations, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Reuters sources say that ByteDance, makers of TikTok's app, posted revenue of 50 to 60 billion won, that's about 7 billion to 8.4 billion US dollars in the first half of 2019, and the company looks to be profitable in the second half. Most revenue reportedly comes from the China-focused products like the news aggregator Jinri Tuntao and the domestic version of TikTok, which is called Douyin. The company also recently launched a search engine, a work efficiency app called Lark, and plans to launch a music streaming app as well. Amazon announced that YouTube TV is now on the Fire TV platform. Hooray! Ooh. The streaming service can be accessed on Fire TV sticks and set-top boxes, as well as the Fire TV Edition smart TVs, though Amazon notes first-generation Fire TV stick and Fire TVs can't support the app. That's just because they're old. Apple released iOS and iPad OS updates to the iOS and iPad OS 13.1.1 software that was released on Friday. Yes, just a few days later, the iOS and iPad OS 13.1.2 updates are now available on all eligible devices over the air in the settings app and include bug fixes for several issues, including problems with the camera, iCloud backup, and the flashlights. All right, let's talk about Facebook. Uh, sources tell in the Wall Street Journal Facebook at this point, uh, is going to pay between 40 and 50 publishers, depending on who you talk to, for content shown in the upcoming Facebook News tab. That's the tab that's going to have curated news from curated publishers expected to launch by the end of the year and going to feature headlines and links from about 200 publications. So either they still have a lot of work to do to figure out who to pay or they're not going to pay a lot of these people. Uh, Facebook is still in content negotiations with publishers over how much content and how much access would be granted in the news section. So maybe that number will go up. Uh, fees are reportedly in the two to $3 million a year uh, range, at least for national publications on a three-year contract. Uh, really interesting look at why this is good for regional publishers, the ones getting less than two to $3 million probably. Like, like, you know, Dallas Morning News, that, that sort of place. Maybe not as attractive if you're the New York Times because it's a smaller percentage of your incremental revenue and you're having to give up some control of your stuff. Yeah, uh, based on the fact that uh, uh, the New York Times and, and other very large publications have, have seen ad revenue shrink so much over the last few years, last decade really, um, I wonder how much this would be a viable revenue stream going forward. Yeah, because the New York Times has, uh, there have been a lot of stories saying that their subscription revenue is doing very well. Uh, their mm -hmm. their ability to, to get people to pay for their content seems to be working for them. Uh, but yeah, a lot of these regional newspapers do not have that story going on, uh, even though they're trying to get people to pay for their digital versions. Uh, my argument has always been that it's because everybody's competing on a national level these days. And so the, the ones that were already at the national level, like Wall Street Journal and New York Times, are going to have an easier uh, row of that. However, Facebook paying publishers when they don't necessarily have to. Uh, there, you know, there's no U.S. law that says they have to do it. Uh, is them trying to play nice and say we 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 know that you're worried about us having control over your content, so let's work something out? I'm very interested to see if it rises to be the majority of the 200 publications, or if there are publications that are just like, yeah, we're we're apparently in there, but we're not getting any money out of it. Yeah, 40 to 50 publishers is nobody. Uh, you know, if you're if you're talking about everything that would surface on Facebook otherwise just being shared by oh, sure. the people yeah. who use Facebook. And, you know, and I don't want to, you know, uh, speculate too much, but yes, how much of this would be, hey, publisher, we're going to go ahead and pay you. This is great for you, right? But let's make sure that your next headline is a little bit more Facebook friendly than it would be otherwise. Yeah, so there might be a little tit for tat you. going on here. I want to help you on that. Totally. Yeah, exactly. 
HP's Spectre X360 13 2 and one still has glossy edges and one USB-C port, but is also slightly smaller and uses Windows Precision drivers for the trackpad instead of Synaptics. Has a 90% screen-to-body ratio and the world's smallest Windows Hello enabled IR webcam. You can choose an OLED 4K screen. Also has a new display control uh, that lets you switch between color gamuts. It features Intel's 10th Gen Ice Lake quad-core processor and Iris Plus graphics and claims to last 22 hours on a single charge. It also arrives in October, starting at $1,099. You forgot the most important feature. What? Pretty. So pretty. It is pretty. <laughs> uh, in fact, before the show, I, you know, Tom was like, how excited are you, Sarah? And I'm like, well, I don't really need a new laptop. But yeah, if I want to compare this to like a MacBook, it, I mean, it's just as nice looking. Uh, in fact, it is becoming less and less distinguishable, really. Well, the Spectre, the, the Spectre has always, uh, been, let's to put it charitably, been compared to the MacBook in its look. Uh, mm -hmm. That's certainly not new. Uh, but over the years, I think it's become beloved amongst those who want a Windows laptop because it is quite a bit cheaper, at least on the starting price, uh, than than a MacBook and, or a MacBook Pro. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a two-in-one, has a touchscreen. Uh, has all that kind of stuff, and and it's gorgeous. Uh, and I don't think it's gotten less gorgeous. In fact, the big, actual, legitimate feature that everyone's talking about is the fact that it's lighter and smaller, but it doesn't feel that way because the screen size is the same. Uh, they they just cut out the bezels. They made them thinner. They made them. Uh, they made the whole laptop way less, uh, and it just feels more compact now. I, I get it. Stack Vanessa in chat says, "I want one," I, and you are not alone. No, you Wall are Street not. Wall Street Journal reports that the U.S. House Judiciary Committee sent a letter to Google on September 13th inquiring about the company's plans to adopt DNS over HTTPS, or DOH, in Chrome. Uh, DNS over D... Sorry, DNS over <laughs> HTTPS uh, passes DNS data over an encrypted connection, which means it prevents man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, it's great for people who aren't you know, going to use a VPN, it's going to, it's going to help prevent their connections in, in more cases. However, the house letter says the committee is worried that this would give Google an, a quote, unfair advantage by denying access to user data by cable and wireless companies. The poor ISPs won't be able to see your traffic, says the letter. According to a Google spokesperson, Google has no plans to centralize or change people's DNS providers to Google by default. Any claim that we are trying to become the centralized encrypted DNS provider is inaccurate. Google is expected to begin testing DOH rollout in Chrome next month. And for comparison, uh, we got none of this concern when Mozilla started testing DOH on Firefox in March of 2018. So this is entirely about Google. Now, DNS over HTTPS does not stop your ISP from being your DNS provider. It also, uh, that, you know, that's entirely up to you. Uh, it's probably not going to keep the DN the ISP from uh, seeing what your traffic is, if, that, if that's how they make money off you. But man, it strikes me that this is such a different story than it was five years ago when we would have simply said, oh, good on Google, providing more tools to keep you private. Where now, there's those of us who know that Google is made up in part of a lot of engineers who are very consumer friendly and just trying to make things good, even if that's not the entire company and the government, which just sees Google as the new Exxon, uh, as the new whipping uh, company that, that you can pick on if they do anything that smells like it might be anti-competitive. Well, you mentioned the Mozilla started testing the same features on Firefox uh, earlier, just uh, about a year and a half ago now. And okay, so that went under the radar, no problem. So if something like this were to be, uh, um, if, if it were to be found that, yeah, okay, this is unfair advantage of Google, got to roll this back, even though the features in many cases are really good for consumers, what does that do to smaller companies who provide the same services? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 not it's not that problem. Uh, this this is Chrome saying, "Hey, we want to give you a way to make sure a man in the middle attack doesn't happen when you're at a coffee shop right. or, or even at your home." Uh, it's not about any ISP or other company being cut out of the endpoints. This this is this is middle encryption uh, and also the kind of DNS that we should be doing. The DNS assist, the uh, DNS system is redundant, I get that, but DNS is horribly insecure. 
uh, we, we should be shifting DNS to be totally encrypted so that you can decide who sees where you're visiting. And I, I, while I, I understand the impetus for this house letter, uh, I think it's counterproductive. And this is where it, it's now certainly politics over what's good for the consumer. Well, on an entirely different note, Wired's Adrian So has a roundup of the best tech and accessories for your dog. The best oh. pet camera is the Pet Cube Bytes 2, which has an app, 1080p camera, 160 degree viewing angle, night vision, and zoom, and the ability to dispense a treat remotely. $249 plus a monthly fee if you want pet detection and smart alerts. Hmm. We also have WhistleGo, listed as the best fitness tracker. For $100, you can track by GPS, set fitness goals for activity based on breed, age, and size. Also has a nightlight. Ms. So also recommends the GeoBit pet tracker if you just want to know where your pet is. The spot-on virtual fence costs $1,500. It can use sock alerts or sound alerts to warn the dog it's near the boundary line. Those are the techies on the list with number 10, best toy being... A stick. Yeah, man. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I I found this, uh, first of all, com commendable job by Adrian So. Uh, it's a great read and good recommendations in here because some of the stuff is, you know, just like really good water bowls and stuff that isn't particularly technology related. Sure. It does show that there's just not a lot of great pet tech out there right now. I mean, these, these, the ones she mentions are really good ones, but... Yeah, uh, this this weekend I pulled out a, a tree that was growing a little too close to the house, uh, and and cut off, uh, you know, I put I, I cut off the tree, put it in the in brush bin, and then went back was like, well, I should cut that a little closer. Tossed uh, the the little bit of the stump, which was I don't know, it's like an arm's width, right? It wasn't a very old tree. Uh, over to get later. Next thing I know, my dog's sitting there chewing on it. Like best toy ever. Thanks, Dad. You know, this yeah. is great. Yeah. So, Oh yeah. yeah, the stick is the stick is a big hit in my house as well. As somebody who is wearing a fitness tracker, my Fitbit mm -hmm. Versa too, mm -hmm. you know, for right. a couple of weeks now, there are lots of metrics where I'm like, huh, okay, I'm getting used to the fact that I have these, and how much of them do I care about versus not care about? When you when you when you get down to pets. Uh, that number decreases quite a bit. Earlier today, I was in the middle of something. I, I I knew that my dog Otis had he had to walk. We hadn't had a good enough walk this morning, so I hired uh, somebody to to walk him for an hour. And this is the sort of thing where it's like, not that I really think that someone's gonna lie to me about where they went and what they did, but it would be cool to be like, okay, I have some GPS tracking information about where my pet's going and, mm -hmm. you know, did they, did they go where they said that the walker said that they went and, and, you know, it, 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 is there any opportunity for me to kind of like check in, uh, you know, mid walk or that sort of thing? I get that. But yes, some of this stuff is the smart pet tech just to be smart. Um, it depends on the pet, but I know a lot of it would go unused in my house. In a, in a more dense area like like I'm in, I, I don't think I would rely on a whistle go to keep my pet in the yard, certainly not with my dogs. Um, but I could see if you just kind of lived out in the country and you're like, well, I just want to make sure they don't get too close to the highway, right? You could, you could right. probably use something like this great. But I don't think there's a lot of really great pet tech out there. Uh, if you're like, no, 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 you guys are missing this one thing that's really great, uh, send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Let us know. Linus Torvalds approved a new Linux kernel lockdown security feature, which, when enabled, will restrict some kernel functionality from even root users. Feature comes with two modes, integrity, which disables kernel features that let a user land process modify the running kernel, and confidentiality, which disables features that extract confidential information from the kernel. The features will ship as a Linux security module as part of Linux kernel 5.4. They will be disabled by default although any distributor can turn them on. Uh, and those of you who are in the know with this sort of thing know that most of the distros, Red Hat, Ubuntu, et cetera, have been putting their own kernel lockdown patches in their own distros already. It's just nice to have it upstream. And Linus Torvalds has been kind of fighting against this, uh, saying, yeah, you don't need it in the kernel. Uh, but security being what it is these days, uh, he finally flipped and said, all right, fine, we, we do need to make it available in the kernel. Still not turning it on by default. That's that's up to you. Uh, but but if you want it, now you've got a couple of lockdown features there. And there's the ability to make some more modules as well built into this. Yeah, I mean, besides the fact that uh, it sounds like he's kind of keeping up with uh, some of the other Linux distros, 
I mean, if he didn't think that it was necessary before, does he really now? Maybe that's not really the point. The point is to to give the consumer the choice. Yeah, I think so. The cus consumer being the distribution makers in this case, I guess. Um, yeah. The the joke is Windows 7 locked down the kernel at a time when Linux was still saying, no, nah, man, you don't want to do that. And now Linux is locking down a kernel at a time when Windows 10 is having some kernel issues. So there's a little snickering going on in the world out there. If you look around on Twitter, I'm sure you can find it. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. I heard a report on The Economist today about UK Parliament's Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee publishing a 54-page report a couple weeks ago called Automation and the Future of Work. The idea was to look at what effect automation would have on work particularly in the United Kingdom. And after months of research based on hearings and written evidence from manufacturers, universities, trade unions, and other organizations, one of the conclusions was, and I'll quote, I'll read it right out of the report, the problem for the UK labor market and our economy is not that we have too many robots in the workplace, but we have too few. In 2015, the UK had just 10 robots for every million hours worked compared with 167 robots for every million hours worked in Japan. By 2017, the UK represented just 0.6% of industrial robotics shipments. So the issue isn't robots taking our jobs so much as, in the UK, not enough robots to give more productive jobs. Part of the problem is the fear. News stories focus on jobs eliminated, which will happen but it doesn't give you the jobs created part of the story in the same way. They'll put 75 million jobs to be eliminated in a headline when what the 2018 World Economic Forum Future of Jobs report noted was 75 million jobs would be displaced by 2022 with 133 million new jobs being created. Now, we've talked about that report particularly and reports like it many times on this show and emphasize that the focus should be on figuring out how to deal with displaced jobs filled by people who can't easily move into newly created jobs. Because even though it's good news that 133 million new jobs are created, even if 75 million are eliminated, not every one of the people who had the 75 million jobs will easily be able to take one of the new 133 million jobs. And this report agrees with that, but also adds that you need a healthy adoption of robots to have those new jobs. And it's uh, we've uh, there's a bunch of statistics. Uh, I got some of these uh, from Diginomics. U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that the most robotics-intensive manufacturing sectors in the United States, which are automotive, electronics, and metals, employ 20% more mechanical and industrial engineers than other manufacturing sectors and pay them higher wages. If you thought robots would just eliminate jobs, that's not what you would expect to see. There was a 1993 through 2007 study by the London School of Economics revealing that robotics increased productivity in 17 European countries by the same amount as steam technology did during the Industrial Revolution, but in a quarter of the time. So in other words, robotics is helping increase productivity and it's doing it fast. Japan has more than 297,000 industrial robots in use, a 23% share of all the robots in the world, and their unemployment rate is 2.4%. So from the UK report again, we have seen from previous inquiries that the practice of businesses such as Amazon and Uber can lead to workers being exploited by increasingly monopolistic firms who earn huge returns that do not flow back to the workers who help create that wealth. More cooperative ownership models as well as greater employee engagement, stronger employment legislation, and fairer corporate tax regimes are key to ensure public support for the benefits of a growth in automation, a rise in living standards, and a fair economy and society. In other words, what this report is saying is, we need to focus on figuring out how to get displaced workers into new jobs, we need to make sure that we've got new jobs for them, which means putting in robots and not fearing that the robots are going to eliminate the jobs. And once that's done, we got to make sure that all the robotic automation jobs don't just benefit one or two companies, or you're not going to see those jobs be as quality as the jobs they replaced. Yeah, and for smaller companies, I know this is a little bit different, but if you're thinking of a large automotive company, it, it is worth... 
uh, it for the company to say, okay, we now have 200 people who used to do this job that have been replaced by robots. Let's put them in a training uh, procedure in order to 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 place them in in better places for them. You're not going to do that for like two or three people or 10 to 15 people. That that isn't advantageous for the company monetarily. So I can see where more and more, if the company's like, okay, well, it's on us to not just fire a bunch of people and hire a bunch of robots, but uh, make sure that the, the the entire company is benefiting from this. When you have a greater amount of people that you can train at once, that 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 just works better for you know the whole process. Yeah, and it, it may be something where countries that are developing their economies right now, I'm thinking Kenya, Nigeria, places like that, uh, might benefit by automating faster, even though that might be publicly problematic because it could create the efficiencies and new companies that provide more employment in those companies. And I say that uh, more instinctually than knowing that for sure, but if you look at the International Federation of Robotics, 10 most automated countries in the world, number one is South Korea, number two is Singapore, then you get Germany, then Japan, Sweden, Denmark, the US, Italy, Belgium, and Taiwan. Now, some of those you would make sense because, okay, these are developed countries, you know, that have been around for hundreds of years and they just kept up, right? That's that's the story in Germany and Denmark and the United States, et cetera. But South Korea, Singapore, even to some extent, Japan and Taiwan, those are countries that were developing countries 20, 30 years ago, uh, but really worked on developing their economies through automation and adding robotics. And they are now very strong economies. Uh, Japan, somewhat like that. With Japan, it was more like, well, we know our population is aging rapidly, but if we want to keep, uh, if we want to keep up, we need to have automation, and that has kept their unemployment low. So I guess uh, this kind of comes back to a discussion that we've had along these lines, you know, over the past mm -hmm. year of if the company wants to replace jobs. Uh, that were previously done by humans with robots. Okay, we've got some we've got some workers that are still skilled and could be more skilled in different areas. Who 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 does this fall upon? Is it is it you know governments? I mean, who who trains the people in order to have a quote better job than they had previously? Mm -hmm. Well, we talked about the fact that Amazon is doing a training program where they're they're telling their workers, uh, we will pay for you to learn new skills to get into programming and, and stuff like that. When you look at the landscape and you see the the lack of qualified applicants in a lot of uh, STEM careers, uh, yeah. science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, I think it's pretty obvious that it would be in a company's best interest to step up and provide this and say, let's figure out how to help transition people. And then, yeah, I, I think it is the government's place to, to with a light touch, it doesn't have to be heavy, look and say, where can we help? Where, where can we be a clearinghouse for information? Where can we encourage programs uh, and, and, and make sure that we're getting folks to do the things that they need to do to make this happen? In other words, I don't, I don't think the answer is one or the other. I think, it's, I think it takes a lot of efforts to do something that complex. I uh, I was going to say that uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's the whole thing is everyone has been looking at it in a very singular fashion, specifically toward labor and what you do with labor policies. And what's needed is a more comprehensive, broad-based approach that includes things like education, uh, um, you know, uh, market controls and stuff like that. Where you know you you can't just focus solely on robotics and and how they impact, but how automation will impact society as a whole and i think you know looking at it as a half a glass half empty instead of a glass half full kind of has i mean kind of the way you look at things determines some kind of like what sort of policies you roll yeah if you, yeah if you look at robotics as an opportunity right if someone said to you we have all this new land that you can develop people look at that as an opportunity they look like oh there's more land what are we gonna do with all this land it's gonna put you know, rental prices down and, you know, houses are getting cheaper. Everyone's going to lose money. If you look at it in the terms of what what does this automation bring, what can you do with it, I think you would probably help to at least get in people's minds 
a, a shift away from like, well, I'm going to lose out to, hey, I can benefit. You know, let me find out the n- number of ways I can, you know, I can do this sort of job or I, c- I myself can invest in automation and start creating my own products if I get a, you know, if I get a, a, an affordable loan from a government, you know, or, or you know, financial institution, something, some along those or lines. Or something like that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. The, the key here is, uh, yes, it's a reasonable fear that like, you know, these companies are trying to sell us on automation is a great thing, but it's going to end up hurting me. That, that's a reasonable concern. Uh, what this report is saying is, Yes, but if you let that be your only thought on automation, it's going to make things worse. Uh, And we do want to make sure that automation has benefits beyond just a couple of big companies. To your point, Roger, like making automation should help more people be able to start businesses or start projects or create careers that they couldn't have otherwise. And and if you, like you say, if you see it as an opportunity for that, uh, I think it really does change how you look at it. In fact, it could be, it could be pitched as a way to make sure that big companies don't have all the power. If it's like, Hey, automation could help you as an individual, the way the internet has helped a lot of people as individuals, including the three of us have careers that we would have re- required a large company to have had before. Yeah. Required to live certain places and mm-hmm. all sorts of restrictions that, right. uh, you know, modern life uh, has has given us some freedom on. Well, if you like robots or don't like robots, guess what? You can participate in our subreddit either way. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right. Uh, we have lots of great conversations. Sometimes they come as emails. Sometimes they don't. Yeah, this actually happened in our Discord earlier today. Uh, we were talking about uh, the new iOS update that came out. Jay at Namadon uh, wrote uh, earlier today, I, uh, dang, it said, 13.1.2 is out, supposedly fixing shortcuts on the HomePod. So that makes me happy. Um, and SCW Lung responded and said, is this where we remind ourselves that they could have skipped 13 and went to 14 instead? Just get uh, <laughs> To which Jay Namadon says, no, though it's unfortunate it's in the state that it is. It'll be interesting if things slow down to typical cadence in a week or two when the hardware is tied to the software release. They paint themselves into a corner as the hardware is the moneymaker. I know uh, Lung was just j- joking about, you know, the number 13. Uh, but but uh, Jay Namadon's uh, very reasonable response, I think, is is uh, important to, to note if you're not the kind of person who has to try this out right away. Um, yeah, maybe wait a couple days after this one to be like, OK, is it safe to go in yet? Because you don't have to upgrade to the new iOS right away. Uh, you can you can wait for the bugs to shake out. And there have been a few more bugs to shake out this time. Yeah, I, uh, I, the person shall remain nameless, but I was uh, hosting a podcast yesterday on a mm. Sunday afternoon, as one <laughs> does, and there was there was a bit of an iOS meltdown that happened, mm. uh, and I was like, this is why you don't update things right before you have to do work, but it happens more and more frequently these days. Yeah, uh, Tom, no, Roger, absolutely. I know we've all been there. Uh, well, did thanks you everybody. upgrade? I'm, I'm curious. Did you upgrade to iOS 13? No, I did not. Okay, so you're because smart. I keep hearing complaints about it, and I want the complaints to stop, and then I will. Uh, well, folks, uh, don't forget we are changing our Patreon rewards tomorrow, October first. Uh, thanks to everyone who gave us feedback about these new rewards. Uh, the current rewards will be delivered tomorrow. And then the new rewards will first be delivered November 1st. And if you want to know all about it, uh, you go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon and find out. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you got feedback for us, that is a great way to give us some feedback. We're also live. If you'd like to join us live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC, put it on your calendar and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>